Green Radar presents Film Dorks. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Film Dorks. Uh, this is podcast number 21. 21. Uh, Old enough to drink. Who yeah. me? That's my age. What? Right. Oh. oh, my Lord. Oh, my God. Oh, like, less than half my age. Uh-oh. Raise a glass. Um, anyway, uh, I'm Tom. I'm, I'm Nick. I'm Kevin. I'm Lucas. And I'm Bridget. And everybody can be her dad. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> don't don't depress us. Don't let's let's not start off on such a downer. That sounds like an 80s movie. I know. My Bridget, 40, your dad's yeah. probably younger than me. It, <laughs> it sounds like an 80s movie that know, could be maybe. directed by perhaps, I don't know, John Carpenter. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, perhaps. let's talk about what we're Why doing. Why would you bring that up? Uh, because I think that's what we're talking about today. We are. We're talking about the the great the goat the de goat John Carpenter. I I would say that John Carpenter is hands down the greatest John okay. John. <laughs> I wish the <laughs> greatest genre filmmaker of all time. Oh, yeah, I thought he, you were going to say the greatest John of all directors. <laughs> yeah, that too. He, he's the greatest John of all directors. I don't know, but yeah, the greatest genre director of all time, hands down. There's nobody yeah. that I even think comes close to what. Carpenter has done the legacy he's left and the genre films that he's made. And he's only made genre movies. Yeah. And which we'll go through most of his career today. And it's something we're going to do more often on this podcast, which I'm really excited about is we're going to be doing uh, deep dives into a single director's career and like they're, they're all of their films. Yeah. So, and, and I, I was excited to start off with this one, of course, because like John Carpenter, there's a reason why he's considered what Nick said, like the greatest genre director is he shaped not only so many of our childhoods, but he also has inspired just so many filmmakers afterwards. Like, and I think elevated it. Yeah. And so many of his films have been a, a, attempted emulations and, yeah. and started like the, you know, his movie started direct to DVD uh, version. I mean, like, yeah. you know, we, I mean, we've already talked about some of his films too, so we yeah. won't be, talking about some of his great movies in depth, but we're we, everybody's picked but an that amazing matter, John Carpenter there's, movie. There's just so a many of awesome of, yeah. John Carpenter movies. It's it's yeah, John Carpenter hasn't done too many bad films. He's yeah, done I mean, a couple he, later in his career that isn't completely they fell, it fell and, off, and, but they still don't suck except for yeah. maybe the war, his last film. I, <laughs> well, I did, did not like it, but we're we'll not going to even talk. We'll work up. Maybe to we'll the get war. there. Yeah. Um, but what, what we're going to do format wise, just so our audience is aware, is each of us chose one film that kind of spans most of his career. Um, not it, we kind of left off the later stuff, which uh, we could always do a sequel to, uh, you know, the John Carpenter. Oh, yeah, dive. Like and subscribe. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. like and subscribe. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. There's so uh, let, let's let's learn a little bit of, a of John Carpenter. Did we. Uh, I have like his Wikipedia and IMDb and I read a little bit about him, but so did anybody did else I. do like, I, look, uh, so I looked into Nick, Why don't you start bit. off? Well, I mean, when he started out, uh, I mean, his first film was dark star. Yeah. That was his first feature. I mean, he did shorts and stuff yeah. like that, but his experience after dark star, I know that he just kind of felt like he was struggling to get another movie up. And, and he kind of started to reserve himself to like, I'm going to be a screenwriter. Um, yeah. Well, but, but you skipped through Dark Star, which we need to at least mention a little bit. So Dark Star is like a dark sci-fi. It's a weird dark sci-fi comedy that is, is his collaborator on that was Dan O'Bannon, though, who would go on to do Alien. And, um, and I rewatched Dark Star. It's, it's free on YouTube. So if anybody wants to go watch it, um, it is kind of a weird mess. And it's like it's. It is not that laugh out loud funny, but the movie kind of like traumatized me a little bit as a kid because of the weird alien in it. Um, and it's just worth watching. Like, it's a fun little weird sci-fi film. It's but not a great John Carpenter movie, but no, when you it watch it, you can see why people started to take notice of it. Yeah. You and know? the fact is that he collaborated with Dan O'Bannon, I think, is worth going back and at least re revisiting yeah. it for that reason. And the effects in it are actually pretty impressive considering it was made with like for like $60,000. Yeah, it was a that when real you go back ultra low budget film. So, yeah. you know, you, you have to expect ultra low budget things yeah. to occur. Yeah. <laughs> but we're not even going to watch the trailer like, on uh, Dark Star. That's like kind of what Clerks was made on, I think. Yeah. Yeah. You know, 
you know, in sixty thousand dollars, like in nineties money too, clerks is probably even cheaper. <laughs> so, so yeah. Um, well, clerks spent a lot of like I think a hundred thousand or more in post production. Sure, that's lot. typically what happens though. The, the Once they, it was distributed, yeah, they always do that in Hollywood for marketing. And be like it was made with nothing, and meanwhile, they sound mixing and color correction, all that cost them like everything. But um, no, so after Dark Star, then yeah, he he actually was a screenwriter, right? The Eyes of Laura Mars is that the one? He did a few. Yeah, he did some writing. But I mean, nothing significant. And then and then he came out with the first movie we're going to talk about, which really launched his career um, and gave him some 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 teeth to, to move cachet. forward in the industry. You know, that's the thing. The industry doesn't want new people, it doesn't want you, it doesn't want you. Um, it wants to exploit your idea, but it doesn't want you. You know, and it wants to get rid of you, you know, and um, and so, you know, it's uh, the the early the early stages of all these people's careers um, is, you know, is, is crucial, you know, and uh, and and there is a reason that Assault from Precinct Precinct 13 launched the carpenter that we know. And, and so, Tom, maybe we should play the uh, the trailer and we can all kind of like. Oh, before we do, though, who has seen the, who has seen this film? Have all of us seen it? I, I've seen it, but I actually right haven't now. seen it in a while. I, I mean, right. you've not. You, Kevin, have you seen it? No, no. OK, no. cool. So I'll, I'll then I'm going to convince you why you should watch it after you watch the trailer. Freeze. This is the police. Drop your weapons and place your hands above your heads. On Saturday. Six members of the gang known as Street Thunder were ambushed by the police. Ah, fucking Street Thunder. On Sunday, Dude, the warlords of Street Thunder. Gangs Thunders in the 80s are so multiracial. Yeah. <laughs> like, this is the 70s, actually. called shit. Street Thunder. Right, and, and they had the day chains, of vengeance. too. I mean, so it's a surprise that there's so many guns. It's with war this gang. in the streets. Oh, Jesus, come on. Come on, I'll give you my money. Just don't hurt me. Please, please. It's terror in the night. It's the most shattering assault on a police station in history. Assault on Precinct 13. This is the siege. It's a goddamn siege. Precinct 13. Cut off. Isolated in the middle of a city. As a human wave of street killers street turns the night killer. into a nightmare. Dude, the gang is so crazy. Uh-huh. Going on down here. We can't find they them. have no moral compass. No, they're they're not even on drugs. You might have hate. No assault on precinct thirteen. Turtle releasing organization. Like so. Okay, assault on precinct thirteen. So John Carpenter, you know, this was his first actual like you know directorial debut for a feature. And if you notice, mm -hmm. by the way, I'm ro I'm rolling with my homies here on the. You're uh, rolling. Look at that. You're rolling this some. Is, Hardcore thugs. But look at they're all like multiracial. It's the gangs in the 70s, man. They like let they let differences aside. Yeah. So yeah. That's so, and I swear like just it comes down to casting. I bet they're like, we only have like five people. We <laughs> you know, budget to cast these five people, throw them all together. Um, this film though is Carpenter wanted, he was a huge fan of westerns. Like he grew mm -hmm. up loving the same kind of westerns that my dad loved. This script is based off of Rio Bravo. Like he was thinking like, how can I do a, um, a self-contained kind of like Western film, but essentially in contemporary time. And of mm -hmm. course, gangs in that era were vicious as, you know, as bad as they are now, like it used to not be so great, especially in Los Angeles. But this film is so, it's, it's a horror film. That's the thing that I, I, right. I never really put two and two together when I was a kid watching this. Cause I had watched this maybe like 20 years ago, seen it again at one point. And then revisited it for this podcast, and it's it is disturbing. I mean, I don't want to do too many spoilers, but there the movie starts out with uh, these this gang members getting like mowed down by the police, and it does not make the police look good. They look like assassins, and then uh -huh. all of a sudden, like uh, you know, the the police station that is closing down, and the um there's this cop who, by the way, a lead the lead in this is a black dude. Uh, let's see, played by played by Austin Stoker. Mm -hmm. uh, He's named Bishop, who's like total badass, cool as fuck dude who, who was casted in a lot of um, like black exploitation movies. But, you know, he didn't get a lot of lead roles. 
And the fact that um, Carpenter, you know, cast him in this just really makes it age well in a way where he's he's a very strong lead in this. And then um, so he's like asking for an assignment. They make him go just kind of babysit this precinct that's closing down. It's it's, it's they're shutting down this one in uh, this precinct in L.A. And then the, at the same time, uh, a, a yeah, killer who's going no more to, crime in this part of town. That's well, right. I think, unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately, it's more that like we just there's the too much to crime in this part of town. Yeah, let's exactly. leave them. Let's just let them fend, fend for themselves. Yeah. But then they're so, but they're transporting um a guy to death row who's like the other lead who's uh you know so it's a a cop and a killer who end up having mm. to team up with like the secretaries of the place because what ends up happening is so uh one of the, one of the guys on the bus gets sick um when they're transporting this killer. Uh, and so they stop off at this precinct because they need to like lock him up while they give this guy medical attention. And then unbeknownst to all of them, these fu- this crazy L.A. gang, because uh, so, some of their gang members are killed. They just go on a kill crazy rampage. Right. So they end up. And this is what fucked me up. Not only when I was a kid, but rewatching again, I was like, is this going to be as bad as I remember? They kill this dude's daughter as she gets an ice cream cone and then they kill the ice cream man. Oh my god, it's so <laughs> fucked up. Like yeah. I remember thinking, like as a kid, being like, "What the fuck? You don't see children get mowed down licking an ice cream cone very often." Well, well and that's one thing about John Carpenter; he does not shy away from violence and really no, and graphic and or disturbing. This made violence. me think of Sam Peckinpah because I've been watching a lot of his. I just watched The Getaway and The Wild Bunch, and I was like. I feel like he's pulling from all the Westerns he loved, but in this yep. film truly is a horror film though. I never got it as a kid, even though it terrified me it was like the setting is at night. And so what ends up happening is this guy's daughter gets killed. So he tracks down, he like chases after the guys that killed his daughter and kills one of the gang members and then flees to this police station that's closing down. So then this insane gang that's on a kill crazy rampage decides to just kill everybody in the police precinct. So it's like, there's nobody's coming to help them. The phones are already shut off. And it's just like a couple of secretaries, a couple of criminals and a cop. And they got to like, and they're just defending this place with their lives. And now knowing that he based this off of a Western, I was like, oh, mm-hmm. it totally feels like, you know, the, the out in the frontier, there's nobody coming to help you. And there's these crazy like engines that are storming the place who have no, per- they have no souls. They're just these asshole, like, you know, which they did in VFW, a remake recently, VFW, where it's like, they're on drugs. That's why they're crazy and storming the place. But it's like these insane psycho people that are barely human that you have to shoot down with shotguns. And, and, and so the action is intense. It's brutal as hell. So watch this film. It seems like this, did this spawn a lot of these sort of like broad brush gang movies? Like, I mean, the Warriors was probably preceded this, but. No, that's a good question. I think the Warriors, as well as um, what was the um, the Bronson one? Um, oh yeah, Death Wish. Death Wish. All of the same era. That's all yeah. this mid seventies. Like yeah. Well, so this was kind of, of the interesting time. tidbits. But I'll say that kind of, this film kind of like though, like it's it, way for movies like Cobra and stuff like that, where these these gangs are just like mindless, uh, you know, just violence. Yeah, just- I, you could not. You could not make this movie this day anymore because the villains have to have like you know they're you have to at least make them human and that's the thing they do they intentionally don't do they make this gang so crazy they're like doing like they're like michael myers they should have made them satan worshippers or something but you know as an action film as a horror action film it totally works you're like okay i'll just believe that there's a crazy gang out there that's like essentially satan worshippers almost that are descending uh, descending on this why do they got to be satan worshippers bro why you got to be distant satanists i don't know they're doing a lot of blood oaths i I don't know who else does blood oaths all the satanists i know are pretty chill people Uh, okay fine they're often vehicles for like moral cautionary tales of all different kinds i mean it's not just you know true Satan worship, right. but like, but this was the <laughs> there's definitely no morals to this no. movie, but yeah. it's it's so fun though, honestly. Like watching it, and you can see so it, it's elements it, of Escape oops. from New York, it's yeah. elements of um, you can see so many of his films, his later yeah. films that come up. You can see, you can see Carpenter. It's a yeah. Carpenter film, and and, 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 it, and and it has a unique voice and a unique and, look, and it has a lot of comedy mixed in with mm-hmm. the, the action and the drama. Uh, yeah, it's 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 a really well done film for super cheap. Like again, he was an independent filmmaker. That's how he started out. So this one made a ton of money for what it was uh, shot for. Um, yeah, because it was shot for on nothing. Yeah, and, he shot on and, a shoestring budget, and um, he was able to make a profit on it. Um, and you know, and honestly, revisiting it, it's it, 
it holds up hands down holds up as like a action horror mm. yep hands so, it's a great it's a it's a totally worth the watch it's also and where he met deborah in Hill. 2005 it was remade Oh yeah, we were not going to talk about it. It's not a bad. The remake's actually pretty decent. It's just not. It's not the original. It doesn't have no. any teeth. It doesn't have the no. teeth. But no. this is where he met Deborah Hill, and Deborah Hill would become his wife as well as co-collaborator producer. She is was it on this movie? Yeah, she helped. Yeah, okay. She worked on this film with him, and Deborah Hill. Like we could do a whole episode just on her because she deserves so much credit for helping create Carpenter. Like the producers oh, in many those, ways don't were, ever yeah. get enough credit. In yeah, that they sense. were like the artists get all the love. But Deborah yeah. Hill was on this one, which would then bring us. Well, to there's a good reason for the that. Ones. Yeah. Because most producers suck. <laughs> <laughs> and all they do is provide the cast and crew with drugs. Um, <laughs> and jobs. <laughs> Wait, what the, now, what the hell? They don't all suck. Some of them are really good at what they do. A lot of them are just uh, assholes who, you know, they couldn't do so they produce. And some of them are really good. I, I would say a lot of the best ones um, really get out of the way and make the movie possible in in the way that the directors and the actors. Uh, yeah, because they're bringing in the, the higher level talent and they know that's talent that they're bringing in. They should just let that talent do its thing. They really, well, yeah, they also should uh, make sure the film gets done on budget and on time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's always a concern. You know, because, I mean, they're making a product. And if it doesn't, they're just going to blame the AD anyways. <laughs> Nick has been burned. Nick has like thrown shots tonight. Oh, bitter. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, okay. So he makes Assault on Precinct 13. Yes. So what does he do next with his career? Okay. So basically, after he makes that, he does make a splash. People take notice of him. He does some writing. Like after that, that's when he did Eyes of Laura, uh, Laura yeah. Mars was after Precinct 13. And then he did, he wrote Zuma Beach, a TV movie. And then he wrote Halloween, right? Yeah. You know, but he didn't direct Halloween. Yeah. Uh, and, um, or yes, he did. No, he directed still. Halloween, yeah. Yeah, not, it was not the other ones. But, but it was that. And he still was kind of, even though he did well, um i thought know, Halloween made a ton of money i mean we've covered it on the show before he started directing some tv and this is where he did like he did the elvis tv movie oh, with, which, and this is where i honestly wanted you, to cover it because but it's a tv movie so we kind of left it off but anyway it stars well, it's a good Russell. tv movie it yeah. is a good tv movie and kurt russell's it, fucking great yeah are you kidding me um, big elvis fan I've never seen um, it. it's a great movie and 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 kurt russell is a great elvis and this is where you know, that bromance started. Yeah. And my God, what if this bromance never happened? I don't think I mean, I'd be the same person today without the the relationship between no, John be Carpenter and, and and Kurt Russell. I have I have fucking Kurt Russell on my leg. And that's the movie we're gonna talk about next. But he did do Halloween and he did do the fog before we were gonna Which you know, we but we covered we've covered on this yeah. show before, yeah. So you can go back to the old podcast and, and we talk a good deal about them. Both amazing. But the thing about Halloween, obviously, though, Halloween is huge. He had a huge mark on, but and it, really but it made so much money. Career. It was like the highest grossing indie film of its time, which is like well, why I, he was able to have a career after. It was because of that that he, um, you know, he got a two picture deal, and and one was The Fog, yeah, um, which also was it, profitable. Right, um, it was profitable. It did well, and it is a great movie in and of itself. Uh, but then. He did the fog. He did was able to do the fog, and then he did Escape from New York. And I believe that was he was going to do a different movie, and Escape from New York, uh, where he teamed up with Kurt Russell again. Um, and and I have yeah, I have that. I have Snake Plissken tattooed on my leg. That's how much this this movie <laughs> affected me in my life. It, uh, this was my favorite fucking movie as a kid. Um, you know, the, I wanted to grow up and I wanted to be two, uh, the combination of two people. One was the outlaw of Josie Wales. I wanted to be Josie Wales. And then I really, really wanted to be Snake Plissken. Um, hands down, there is, and I, I challenge anyone, name a cooler, a fucking cooler, more badass. <laughs> All right, let's Char do right. character and sick. Well, let's go to the videotape. Let's see the uh, trailer. New York, 
1997. The entire city is a walled maximum security prison. The bridges are mined. The rivers are patrolled. And the United States You'll Police Force has interested in no that I'm going in. The person that shot those shots right there with the glider is one of the biggest film directors of John all time. Carpenter's Escape from New York. He did additional the photography. High adventure of the future. One man must go in where no man has ever gotten out. And if he comes back alone, his nightmare has just begun. Who are you? John Carpenter's Escape from New York. I heard you were dead. This stuff is like gold around here, you know. from New York. The greatest escape of them all is about to blow the future apart. This movie is incredible. One, what's interesting about this too has a lot of horror elements to it. Yeah. And this entire... Of me as a kid. This movie, entire movie was shot at night. Um, almost like everything. Two or three scenes, yeah. Yeah, and you can tell. And those are in interior scenes for the most part. Like, but it's all shot at night or, you know, dusk or dawn. And, um, and there, it really builds a, an atmosphere that you don't get from most movies. It's dark and, and, and it's, re and it's beautifully, phot the photography is incredible. In it. Well, it was done and, by Dean Cundy, who did Jurassic Park, Back to the Future, the whole series. He did, um, uh, Hall well, Halloween Hall 13 he did uh, almost all of John Carpenter's films <laughs> yeah the guy's in, is so goddamn talented and so by the way so I had the blu-ray I sorry I, I watched this originally on like VHS or whatever and it looked like crap mm -hmm. get the blu-ray because the it's beautifully shot like or the, just the, watch the, it on the, HBO Max because it's in high def it's the high okay. def version so it looks great um but a couple of really fucking amazing things about this movie other than the fact that Kurt Russell is just He's he's such a better actor than I think people give him credit for. He's fucking amazing. And when you look at even all the films that he's in, we're going to talk about another one that he's in later. But he is so, he's always different. You know, he's not. And I, well, I can't well, imagine the... anybody playing Snake Plissken other than Kurt Russell. What, if, what's your favorite part about him? Yeah. yeah. About the character or about the movie? Yeah. No, the character. Um. There's just his there's such a level of and when you watch it, it's kind of like how many actors could pull this off without it being super cheesy? Like he's so stoic and so fucking serious and so angry. Like there's such a subtle bubbling anger in everything that he does, you know, and he he has such a. I don't give a fuck attitude. Um, well, do you know that originally he was supposed to, they shot. A, it wasn't going to be him. No, they no, didn't no, want no, Kurt but, Russell. No, but I originally they also had a scene where you see him commit a crime. He like robs a bank and he, so there's all this like. The Cleveland job. Why, yeah. There's all the setup of why he's supposed to be this villain. Right. And that ends up becoming, yeah. you know, a hero, but a hero, instead, anti -hero. They, just, they, they cut it out. And honestly, it's so much better. The less you know about Snake Plissken, the it's just better. This, like, yeah, yeah, he's, he's like just this, this mythic mystery. Billy the Kid hero. I mean, let's face it. That fucking scene when he's introduced and and and, and the, the supporting cast in this movie is phenomenal. Like it's this is movie is stacked. Dude, Lee Van Cleef. Lee Van Cleef. Harry Dean Stanton, Stanton Adrian oh Barbeau, God. fucking uh, 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 what uh, Donald Pleasance? Come on, yeah. unbelievable performance and an Incredible. unbelievably good actor. Isaac Which, by the way, he would work. He would work with almost all these people again, except for Isaac Hayes, on on subsequent films. Yeah, um, but what I, you know, they didn't. They didn't want the studio. Didn't want Kurt Russell because Kurt Russell had only done Disney movies before this, like yeah. he was Escape from Which Mountain. And, and he's a really Tron, like he, wasn't Tron before this. No, Tron. I think it was after this one. I, if, I don't know if it was before oh, good, or after. Good question, that was Bridges. Bridges, though. That, that was Bridges, though. Yeah, that oh, was Bridges. Bridges. That's right. Yeah. 
but he was I only in a couple of Disney it. movies and and he, well, he did the Elvis movie too, you know, so he wasn't like the baddest. They wanted Bronson. Wait, you want Carter. Elvis to be our, our badass? Yeah. Uh, right, exactly. Yeah. You want Elvis and the guy who saved the, the twins from Witch Mountain? Uh, but they wanted Bronson, but Carpenter's like, no, he's too old. Um, and, I thought that, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he he's never had like that sort of like edgy sort of uh badass he, he's he's always just been like the quiet who bronson yeah 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 he's the quiet guy but he's badass i mean well, you just uh once yeah, upon a time in the west, west whole different and, make 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 you change your mind about charles bronson but honestly i think it, young bronson would maybe would have worked for this but uh, yeah but he was too old at this point like and, this and, and 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 carpenter had to convince him to let him use kurt russell and thankfully they did because his performance is just so fucking badass and you you watch this when you watch russell and you watch russell in any of the films that we talk about tonight i and i don't i can't think of another actor whose timing is is more perfect than his he knows how to time a line like that the, the, the opening scene where it's him and, and van cleef van and cleef, it's yeah. the it's the introduction to 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 him and the, the 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 long beats and the dramatic pauses you take where they like take a drag of the cigarette and then just throw a one-liner at him but in a way that's so fucking subtle you just well he has good, like, com- he has good comedic so- timing but it also makes good dramatic timing i mean yeah but also and, and- i think with kurt russell too like if you look at all the films he's been in like if he wasn't in the roles like those movies could have gone so haywire because he's in a yeah. lot of like let's say kid and family movies that yeah. like turn out to be like good movies like could have yeah. tanked Captain if you got anyone else yeah oh yeah <laughs> right. which i fucking love right. i mean there's a ton of movies that he's in like that um you know, but it, it, that's because Kurt Russell is a fucking great. I got to show you though the the lead he, makes a difference. And uh, well, so who else has seen this one besides Nick and I who are gushing over this film? Are oh, you, I mean, I, I, I saw it like a long time ago, and it didn't have the the same effect on me that it did on Nick for sure. Right. Um, I I wouldn't say that I don't like it. Like I def you know it's a definitely a good movie, but it it suffers a little bit from like that sort of uh, slow pace kind of thing that, that disagree <laughs> well no but uh, but tom i honestly it's, it's just a like, big we're... difference between this and like the 18 show that i used to be watching you know or uh, <laughs> you know but i think you should revisit it and i swear to god get the blu-ray yeah when's or the watch last on time HBO, you watched man. it because i think oh, I haven't now... seen this since i was a little kid watch yeah. it again you'll appreciate it way more now as an adult like but you'll thing, see yeah. But, and okay, so what I was talking about in the trail with the glider scene when 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 Snake Plissken's landing yeah. the glider on the World Trade Center, that was shot by none other than James Cameron. Nice, yeah. Who okay. was working for Roger Corman at the mm-hmm. time, and they needed an additional photographer, and he shot a bunch of that stuff. Wow. Um, so there you go. James Cameron worked on Escape from New York. I mean, so this film, though, when I was a kid... I, it was a horror film for me. Like I remember it is I, kind I, of a horror. It film. was really scary to watch this film it, because it's the, creepy, right? New York that they create in it is a, uh, you know, it's a hell zone and you, and you're and, and so much tension. You're like, what is going to happen from one scene to another? And so many just like crazy weirdos come out of nowhere and just are like, there's like heads on pikes and it's you know, it's yeah, like, it's, it's, it's it like is hell creepy. on earth. It's scary. It's cool. it's, that's what I mean. Yeah. Like, there, he he brings in it's a sci-fi movie, but there's definitely a horror element. It's the yeah. same with like that, like Assault on Precinct. Thing. It's an exactly. action movie, yeah. Western hybrid. That, but it also has a horror element to it. Like almost every movie that he does, I mean, he, he does, does bring this creepy he, fucking he kind vibe. Kind of invented to the action horror genre. I mean, I can't right. really think of anybody else who did that type of film. That's like right. You know, a, a traditional action it, film as well but then to also- handle uh genre bending scripts yes. really well because i mean like a, a lot of these movies are are double yeah which we'll get into actually we, we should probably get into the next one yeah. so after he did yeah. well, in new york was yeah. a financial success right before like, before we move on and yeah, i will yeah. say this because we're not going to talk about this movie and it's later and his later things but oh, i did watch escape from la right afterwards not a fan of that one. no okay watch it again yeah. No, I will. I'd love to watch. Kurt Russell because will watch it again. It, no, it's not. And, and it's, Bruce it, Campbell's in it. Yeah, he is in it, and <laughs> that's a great scene. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, no, it's not. It. It, it can't quite hold a candle. Really to, 
hold the candle he to the serves, first one. He serves a fucking wave. Of, oh, it's so it's cheesy. so silly. Uh, it's so silly, but it, it there uh, are some really fucking fun moments. And it, the it, basketball and it's, scene was driving me crazy in that, but then it ends really funny. With yeah, me. it's awesome. The end of the basketball scene rules. Yeah. But yeah, he really does make that like full court shot, right? Yeah, yes. yeah, he yeah, he, the clock is down. It's the last yeah. shot, and he, he just it's, heaves it's, the ball and it lands in. It's fucking awesome. So silly. Um, All right. It, it is a silly movie, and it, it's not nearly as good as the first one, but it's still, it's still fucking fun, and and you still get Snake Plissken. And he does have some great lines. And they update his costume, and it's it's super cool. It's <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. It's it's ridiculous. As as long as you don't go into it expecting to see a great movie, it's totally <laughs> worth watching. It's totally worth watching. And um, I don't recommend you watch Escape from New York and then Escape from LA. Yeah, give yourself I, a I little make breathing. Sure, give it a breathing room because because yeah, you're not going to get Escape from New York again. But you will get a fun film. And if you live in L.A., it's really kind of fun to watch because I hadn't seen it since I moved here. And like all the the fucking L.A. references and L.A. in complete and utter shambles and some it's some ridiculous stuff. It makes it uh, a little a little more fun on top of that. So there's that. <laughs> all right. So then after he does Escape from New York, which is also financially successful. Yes. Um, and, so then- and and critically successful. So then what does he do after that? How, where does his career go after that? Uh, Escape from New York, he follows right up with a thing. And which, another Kurt yeah. Russell movie, we've which is we've covered. Past. But holy Christ, is that an incredible movie? If you haven't seen I'm it. That's maybe his best film. Sci-fi and horror. Yeah. Sci-fi horror. Again. Where they go to again. Antarctica, right? Yeah, it's in Antarctica. And, and uh, there's a thing. But the problem yeah. is the thing is uh, pr- premieres at the same time as E.T. And it's a a financial and critical flop. People fucking hated that film when it first came out. It sucks because it's now considered one of the like best horror films. And it is hands down one of John and it is best films. But it, it was a failure, a financial failure. This, he was toxic. It was the first time he had like a studio film that was, it was not an independent film and he was fucking toxic afterwards. So to cl- claw his career back, he did Christine. And I, yes. which is a, a he directed adaptation. it. He didn't write it. Yeah, but it's an adaptation from Stephen King. And I almost chose that one for tonight because I fucking love that film. Like Christine it's right. is one of the best. Watch it again. I'm not kidding you. Watch it again. It's one of the best adaptations of a Stephen King film ever done. But we're well, not going to go into that not, film much that's now. That's not saying much, bro. Yeah. No, we're not reviewing that one. <laughs> but we're not reviewing that one. No, we, we, we're not reviewing that one. But after that, he got... Starman. But Christine did well. Yeah. It, did, it did well enough. Right? It, it did made well. Money, so and he directed... He was, yeah, he, did, he didn't get to make anything of his own for a no. little bit. He had he had he he got spanked for the thing, which is yeah. stupid because it's one of the best horror uh, movies you know, ever made hands down. Rightly so. He didn't make money. And then, so then he did Christine and then he did Starman. Starman. In 1977, Voyager 2 was launched into space to the outermost regions of the universe. It carried an invitation in all languages for alien life forms to visit our planet. Someone, somewhere listened and accepted our invitation get ready someone is coming do they make this way more like horror lights ever known before can you clone a living organism from the yeah it makes it almost (laughs) hypothesizing a technology that's probably a hundred thousand years ahead of me he has powers we cannot imagine and the face and touch of the man she loved. <laughs> Jeff Bridges is so good at good at this. I said greetings. Yeah, he's What's amazing. What's the matter with you? How much English do you understand? I understand greetings in 54 planet Earth languages. Do you seriously expect me to tell the president that an alien has landed, assumed the identity of a dead house painter, and is presently out tooling around the countryside in a hopped up 1977 Mustang? You're not from around here, are you? Think of what it would be. That guy was like in every Asian movie. Yeah, he was. Think of what we could learn. learn. You don't understand, there isn't much time, please. Yeah, Karen Al. Smoking Karen Al. He doesn't want to hurt Leather jacket. Can't you just leave him alone? What the hell ever happened to good manners? We invited him here. So far to come, so much to do, 
so little time to fall in love. Look up. Company's coming. John Carpenter's Starman. The trailer really hops up the the sort of action aspect of this movie. Yeah, but it's not as actiony as it, it looks. It's not. It's totally a character movie. Yep. It's it's one of my favorite Jeff Bridges roles ever as well. Um, I mean, he he talked about how studying for the to play this character fundamentally changed the way that he spoke for like years. Oh. Um, didn't yeah. he model it after birds? Like some of his like movements were all modeled after birds and shit. He did like insane yeah. Yeah. work on this yeah. character. And he's so, incredible in the film. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Starman is basically the story of three different characters. There's Karen Allen's character, Jenny Hayden, and she is a recent widow of Scott mm. Hayden, who um, is then revived in effect, uh, cloned basically by this Starman that... Um, received our invitation from Voyager 2 to come visit Earth and then did come visit Earth and was promptly shot down by NORAD. Right. um, The entity escapes the ship and it's floating around looking for what to do next and it finds Jenny Hayden drunk and asleep in her house uh, because she's mourning her, her dead husband. And it finds a lock of his hair and extracts the DNA in a sequence that me as a little kid, like really showed in a very easily digestible way, like how super visual, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, it, it plays on his horror uh, Mm -hmm. chops really well. Cause Mm -hmm. the, the, the scene where this thing starts out as a baby and then grows in front of her eyes into a full grown, Jeff Bridges um, it is, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's really like from her perspective, fucking terrifying. And, and, and then like it holds a gun to her head and it that has no idea what that even is, you know? Right. Um, so from there, I mean, her, her character is, uh, you know, mourning this guy and then all of a sudden he's there again, alive and right. Um, and it's him, and, but it's not him. It's totally it's not like, him. Right. It's complex. And, um, and the third character is uh, Mark uh, Sherman, who's played by. And this is the guy you were talking about, Nick, who's like in everything. Yeah, of in the everything. Era. He was he yeah. in uh, and, Close uh, Encounters. He's played by Charles uh, Martin Smith. Yes, who and in this movie, I could not, I, I could not help but notice that he looks like it's like if Matt Damon was playing Ron Howard. <laughs> um, <laughs> Which I hope happens someday. That is. Yeah, that'd be cool. But. <laughs> He looks so much like Matt Damon to me. It's insane. Um, <laughs> but he he's uh, basically Carl Sagan in this movie. He plays a yes. governor right. at SETI. And he put the gold disc in the Voyager 2. And, and now he gets to reap what he sowed. You know, there's an alien that has actually come to Earth. And now he's trying to find out. You know, he's trying to meet it. He's trying to study it. Um but the military is only concerned He's trying to kill it. Yeah, basically. And so, so the, his whole character is him fighting against the government and trying to get to this thing, you know, and, um, and eventually they do. And he finally gets to meet him in one scene. And it's, it's great. But it's awesome. Yeah. There's so many good <laughs> scenes in this, but, but I, I wanted to point out a couple other things. Uh, Michael Douglas was the executive producer. producer right? Oh, nice. And he chose, John Carpenter and there's a quote that he told the Boston Globe that John has a great sense of style and deals with action masterfully and I knew he'd get to the emotional core of the story yeah. and yeah. I, I would say that he he nailed that you know I yeah mean, um, you know Michael Douglas was a producer on One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest that's like launched his actual career because he was like Hollywood royalty but he hadn't done anything and then that yeah. So it shows he always has had great taste in films. I mean, so much of producing as Nick was shitting all over producers, but it's all about, but it's all about taste. Right. And the fact that he, you know, he chose John Carpenter. So the the other thing is, uh, well, we mentioned ET earlier. Uh, This movie was developed side by side with ET and Columbia decided to green light this and, and passed on ET and then ET went on to be success that they actually I went to ET six Ouch. times as a child and I cried every goddamn time ET died. Yeah. Yeah. Well, wait, so wait, who passed at Columbia? 
Game Boy ET. Columbia passed on ET and greenlit Starman. They they yeah. they, well, they that's good. That this was the better script, and they end, but they ended up and it was. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, um, and it's technically the better movie. That, they were um, they they were considering Tom Cruise and Kevin Bacon for the main roles, and either of those would have been an absolute disaster. Um, yeah. Because the, the this movie lives and dies on the chemistry of these two characters, yeah. and it, it's it's one of the most um, subtle and human stories. Yeah. Like it's yeah. it's the least sci-fi sci-fi movie you've ever seen. Right. Yeah. But it, it's it's an endearing love story. It's human and it it and it's, it's smart, um, and and it explains things in so many different ways that you don't look at at you know life on Earth, life and relationships. Right. And yeah. Well, the, it, the thing it, that it, fucks me up about this movie though is like Karen Allen will never get credit for being. She has to play the straight woman. Like she's the emotional core of the whole film. Mm-hmm. You know yeah. and. So yeah. like Jeff Bridges does an incredible job being a wacko weirdo, you know, like non-human that has to learn to be human. But then the entire movie, she has the whole like she carries it on her fucking shoulders. And by the way, like Karen Allen, seeing her in that, like definitely fucked me up as a kid because that was like she was like I, I always talk about the crushes I had as a kid that she like from Indiana Jones and this movie. Like she's so great at, at just giving pathos and, and giving humanity to a character and it's all literally they put the film on her shoulders and they're like jeff bridges gets to be wacky and weird you get to just like carry the film so good luck with that yeah so i mean yeah. looking at this as as a little kid it was like a crazy ass like alien adventure movie right and, yeah. but seeing it as a grown-up you know like it, it's 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 so thin yeah it's so thematically heavy it, it's so well told and 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 it just it does such a service to a really great script. And but it also yeah, shows John Carpenter. So he has done in his career. Now we see him do like action horror. He's now done like dr- uh, sci-fi drama. Like yeah. when we, when we said at the top of this, that he is like a genre master. I mean, if you look at that compared to the thing, I mean, yeah, that was the thing horror is sci-fi, a visceral yeah. gore fest. And this yeah. is just like the sweetest love story ever. I mean, I, yeah. I cried twice during this it's movie. It's just the idea that he makes great films. And the fact that Michael Douglas, I guess he saw that in him, which is the idea of being like, yep. it is genre films, but he does them with fucking heart. And by the way, that's the world we live in now. Like mixed genres, like genres have yep. blown up now where it's like, you can get away with anything. And part of it's because, to, because of John Carpenter. It's so, not part of it. It's probably mostly of it, because yeah. of but, so. No, but let's continue this going because what right. Well, let me career let me, let me just say one sure. thing about John Carpenter. Like, it's not just that John Carpenter was a great writer and director. He also scored a lot of his films oh, and we his scores. Even talked about that yet? Like, I we didn't even talk oh, about the um, score. To, uh, did he do Starman? York, no, no, this don't, was no, 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 no. He, he also didn't do the thing, which is one of the best scores in his films. He did. did. He did part of the thing, though. He did well, one of what. Yeah, but he, he, got he worked best. with Alan Howarth uh, a lot. But he got it. Yeah. Did he get Marconi to do the fucking score? For yeah, he did. Mark like, Marconi did this. Big, and he even said when he did Assault on Precinct 13 that he was riffing off of Marconi. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. And yeah, he got to hire huge, him to make the fucking score. A anyway. huge influence. But he also has been composer, uh, director. Yeah. He's been an actor. And he an did editor, it. Editor. Yeah. Additional crew, art department. He's done second unit directing. Assist, Why he's my fucking hero. He's assistant director. Guy. Camera and electric department. Yep. I mean, he's done fucking everything in, in the industry. He's an yeah, well, he is. That, that's one of the best ways to become a great filmmaker is to understand all. You know, everything, what everything right. does, and and more importantly, why. Yeah. Um, well, but, so okay, but, so then let's get to the next one because yeah. he after this film, which was critically, well, I, th- I think it did all right critically, but then financially, right. it made um, money. It did, yeah, it then he blew it. Money it didn't on. make a whole lot of money either. It cost oh, twenty okay. million and it made twenty nine. So it didn't lose yeah. money, but it didn't make money. Yeah. But then, so he took the, he took what little credit he had, and he made what film? Big Trouble in Little China. <laughs> I Big Trouble love in John Carpenter's bank account. <laughs> yes. And this is why I'll forever love him, is that he went, the next film he made is probably my soul film. Like, that's the one that fills me with joy. So, Bridget... This was you've never yes. seen it before, and you. I've never it. seen this film before. I've actually seen very little John Carpenter films. I've only seen Big Trouble now, Big Trouble in Little China, and I only ever seen Halloween in the Fog. I've never seen like any of his other films. 
So okay. I oh, was, you have some the words gauntlet is thrown. Yeah, out I know, I know. Uh, so I knew nothing about this film going into it, and I'm actually so glad that I didn't because it, the movie caught me so off guard. Um, I want to start with the trailer though first. Yeah, let's we get do into the trailer. This. Yeah. We'll get into it. this is Jack Burton in the Pork Chop Express, and I'm talking to whoever's listening out there. It's a pretty amazing planet we live on here, and a man would have to be some kind of fool to think we're all alone in this universe. There is a hidden world where ancient evil weaves a modern mystery. What's going on here? Is this some kind of magic? The darkest magic. Ow! Song is a goddamn national treasure. They call it huh. Little China. Finally, we shall bring order out of chaos. The Chinese stand. <laughs> it's where big trouble was waiting for Jack Burton. Who? Jack Burton. Me. <laughs> Jack. Jack. They told him to go to hell. He make one move. <laughs> That's just where he's going. <laughs> Somebody, I don't care who, tell me what is going on. <laughs> what? That's an I awesome title no sequence. Idea. I've never seen it. I have no idea. I have no idea. Yeah, many mysteries, many unanswerable questions, even in a life as short as You were not put on this earth to get it, Mr. Burton. <laughs> oh, it's like rests in your capable hands. Hey, I'll do my best. Oh God, is this really him? Oh, Kim Kitchell. This is gonna take Cracker Jack timing, Wang. One, two, three. Oh my god. We may be trapped. Hold me in concentration. Sushi. Oh, yeah. You ready, Jack? I was born ready. I was born ready. Way to go, Jack. Jack Burton's coming to rescue your summer. Hey, what more can a guy ask for? 20th Century Fox presents Kurt Russell in John Carpenter's. Big trouble in Little China. It's on the reflexes. <laughs> just like right off the bat, like this is a movie, like everyone just like turn off your brain and just sit down and watch it for the hour and a half that it is. Just take it for what it's worth. It is so la unbelievably laugh out loud funny mm -hmm. in like the best ways possible. Like it's very, very <laughs> Expected. and you wouldn't think like sometimes movies like this people really hate because it's a lot of like silly comedy yeah. like it's just like kind of stupid <laughs> comedy but this movie is so funny I mean okay so one it stars Kurt Russell but it's got Kim Cattrall Dennis Dunn and James Hogg I mean like these uh -huh. are people who I would watch like in any movie to begin with I know right and it <laughs> Oh my god! I'm sorry. I'm just laughing. So. But, I mean, can you describe the plot though? Because the plot. Okay, is so yeah, bizarre. I want to read this I IMBD plot sure. because, like, if you just read this plot, like, you would not watch this movie. Like, this is what the plot it says. <laughs> it says a rough and tumble trucker helps rescue his friend's fiance from an ancient sorcerer in a supernatural na battle beneath Chinatown. Yeah, <laughs> which is well, they're true. not wrong. That, that was pretty, that's the like, quickest you could. Yeah, but then yeah. it's like it's like you get a truck driver, and then somehow you end in supernatural Chinatown. <laughs> like, <laughs> it, yeah. It, it, Listen, it, you can live by sense. Jack Burton's words on that CD, and there's yes. a lot of them. <laughs> yes, this is like a so much. This is like a funnier version of like Race to Witch Mountain because it's like the same sort of ah, like this truck driver just like stumbles into this like supernatural world, like mm -hmm. unknowingly. All he cares about is trying to save his truck because he loses his truck, and. Oh my god! So this this film is just hysterical, and just the plot of this alone. <laughs> okay, so um, Kurt Russell plays his truck driver, and basically his friend who's his name again? I can't remember. Kim Jack Burton. Yeah, Jack yeah, Burton. Jack Burton. Yeah, Jack Burton. No, Jack Burton. Because he says it like five hundred thousand times. Yeah, yes, he talks in yes. the first or third. Yeah, his name is his personality trait. It's like a personality yeah. trait. It's just yeah, saying his totally. name. Yeah, totally. Yeah. 
And so his buddy Wang Chai, like they need to go, like go to the airport to pick up his fiance. And like, there's this whole comment about how she has green eyes and it's like, oh, like that's really rare. And <laughs> okay, I guess <laughs> like, it is. That's, that's really fun. weird. Okay, I guess green eyes are rare. And then she gets kidnapped <laughs> at the important. airport. Yes, it is important. And she gets yeah. kidnapped at the airport and it becomes this like whole uh, like rescue mission to find her. But when they're doing this, they stumble upon these like ancient warrior groups. <laughs> One is known as like the Chilling. three storms, yeah. which is thunder, rain, and lightning. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's ridiculous. There's Mortal like, Kombat ripped off. Yeah, I, totally. Right. I was going to say, when I watched this again, I didn't really realize it before. But Mortal Kombat ripped off every fighting oh, yeah. character in its first well, they also, yeah. iteration. It's Mortal Kombat well, go back is and watch big Shaw trouble. Brothers, though. Go back and watch Shaw Brothers. Yeah, they that's ripped true. Off, Mortal Kombat ripped off a lot of that, too. But anyway. Yeah, well, it's just this this one scene. And I like this was so funny. They like like Jack Burton and Wang Chai, they're driving in his truck and they come into this alley and they stumble upon like this like funeral there's like a funeral going on in this like alleyway and then all these like different like ancient warrior tribes show up and they start going to battle and it's like them sitting in the truck just like commenting on this battle and then yeah. all this, like that's doesn't literally make any what this, sense. it doesn't make any sense and then all of a sudden so J- james hong plays dave david lopan lopan uh, yeah. and he's I like that his name david he, i never i know david, it's david that's lopan what it, says. it is that his name david <laughs> And he's like, he's what I would call like the mightiest warrior, I guess, sorcerer. 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 And he he has this curse. And in order to break this curse, he needs right. to marry Very a woman with green, green eyes. eyes. <laughs> you think that wouldn't be very difficult, which they like kind of address in the film, but like they do anyway, a little bit. It's yeah. so bizarre. And so, yeah. So like originally it's uh, Jack Burton's buddy's fiance is who he kidnaps. And then Kim Cattrall who plays is that, Gracie. Is that a huge plot hole where you're like, wait, you were looking for a Chinese uh, woman with green eyes? You could have just gotten an American the whole fucking yeah. time. Some right, Irish girl. Right. It doesn't then matter. All of a sudden, Gracie walks matter. in and he's like, oh, you also have green eyes? Like, I'm going to marry you me now. Me too. Yeah, turn and, that and just brain like, off. His, that honestly, you know what scared me? This movie is just like the makeup on James Hong's face. Like he looks <laughs> yeah, like a vampire. Yeah, super creepy and gross looking. So, yeah. And then like when he goes to like, so basically what happens is like, light comes like blasting out of his eyes and mouth but he makes this really just ugly face before it happens he like everything starts to shake on his face it's like his eyebrows and like mustache like and teeth start shaking it's like that i did not need to see that ever in my life but it's so funny like this this is so outrageously hysterical like the one scene like like Kurt Russell is like shooting one handed with like a machine gun. And it's like, it's like he has a safety on. He's like, yeah, like I got this. And he's like, why isn't the gun working? And the guy's like, safety. He's like, oh, I knew that. And they just yeah. like, Da-da-da. oh my God. Like, and his he's outfit. Like, have, he's like, you never, you never plugged somebody for? He's like, yeah. Sure, I have. Yeah. <laughs> sure, I have. But- he's great because he's totally useless in this yeah. film mm-hmm. as a char- mm-hmm. his character. He's not the hero. No. He's he's completely in the way he's this, the he's entire a film sidekick. Yeah, he's yeah. it's a, but but he thinks he's the hero yeah. and it's it works so well. <laughs> but it's so I mean, I honestly don't think any other film, even maybe since has figured out that idea where it's like the, the, the star of the film is actually the sidekick to the story that's going on. And in right. his mind, he's the hero. And like yep. that is so fucking clever. I honestly can't even think of another film that has figured that out. Well, if you, like, think, if you think about it, a lot of John Carpenter's movies are commentaries on a lot of different social aspects of the world. Right. Yeah. And this one, very much so. It, I mean, he's an American tourist in China. Like, that's yeah. mm-hmm. what they're Right. <laughs> also, I yeah. just want to give a shout out to whoever costumed this movie because, like, Kurt Russell's yeah, outfit, right. the majority is this muscle Listen tank that Lucas is muscle currently tank. wearing <laughs> and then tucked into, like, almost borderline skinny jeans and knee-high boots like that's what yeah. he's yep. wearing oh my god the duration of this movie it's amazing it's like a cartoon character <laughs> yes they no, know the- how to dr- listen john carpenter knows how to dress kurt russell <laughs> well but think about this though about this film at the time that it came out like 95 percent of the characters in this film are not white 
They're like Asian. I mean, no, granted, no. not all no, Chinese because they were yet. like casting around. Like it's Hollywood. And, was and some of the most prominent uh, Asian character actors of the time too. Yeah, got mm-hmm. to have so much fun. They didn't just play like a stereotypical character. They got to like have mm-hmm. weird, odd characters who were like sorcerers. Yep. And it, and yeah. so as much as there's a, a, a rewatching this one, I have to admit, I was getting a little nervous. I've seen it so much in my life. And I was like, is this not going to age well? Is it going to feel no, like it ages amazing. It, and there's a reason it does is because it, it's just it, it's such a carnival of weirdness yeah. that like it, it's hard to even say that it's doing like it does anything wrong. And I honestly have to admit, like so many of my friends growing up because they grew up in um, Long Island where there was a lot of the universities and things were like Asian kids who fucking adored this movie. I love to hear from <laughs> our audience. Like seriously, growing up like Dave Tung, you know, Jeff Pornomo wow. and yeah. Ben Pornomo, like these are my buddies growing up. They fucking love this movie as much as I did. So I would love yeah, to hear funny. from our uh, audience out there if that, you know, th- that's the thing is like we're at a time where everybody's like, oh, cancel culture, cancel culture. I'm like, no, nah, if you do things well and you do them with heart, like that's what it's about. Just, you know, yep. but- yeah, well, yeah, and also b- before we move on from this film, yeah. this also like totally tanked at the box office. Oh, for sure. This is like, ruined like, this, the rest of this, his career. This ruined him to send him back into just straight independent films. And God but love it, him for it. But it has a good since since this came out though, it has a very good Rotten Tomatoes rating yeah. and mm-hmm. a whole classic. Like that's yeah. yep. what people have described it as. So yeah. no, I mean it I is recommend absolutely the watch. Po- it's it a cold classic, but time. it did te- it did terrible. The box office that got panned, but it built a huge following, and there's a reason for it. And when you watch it, I think you can appreciate it probably better now than you could at the time that it came out. Like it just yeah. it ages well, and even the effects at that time, like you know, I rem- like with Escape from New York, like John Carpenter wanted to use computer generated effects, which at that time we're talking about the early ages were super fucking expensive and terrible. Yeah, but yeah, but the, the charm of the like sort of cheesy, uh, there, there's like a cheesy aspect of this and it has a ton of charm. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. It's so yeah. fun to watch. So the next one he did after this was Prince of Darkness, which I also maybe would have done that one because it's a completely underrated Carpenter one. Yeah, and it has it. Alice Cooper. <laughs> it has Alice Cooper and it has a great soundtrack done by Carpenter as well. But we're gonna, it also did not make money. And, and um, so then we're going to get into what was his. But it comes to his last great film. This, I think, is, you know, as much as I like Prince of Darkness, the next one is the one that, yeah, is the, is the last it's one that last I consider. It's his last great, great, well. great film. And it's great. And Kevin, and why don't you tell us what it is? Oh, yeah, let's play the trailer. Yeah. All right, yeah, let's, let's show drive. the trailer. What do these things want, and why are they here? You still don't get it, do you, boy? They have recruited the rich and the powerful. They're running the whole show. Wake up! They're all about you, all around you. Blinded us to the truth! Take a look. They are safe as long as they are not discovered. I don't know what they are or where they came from, but we gotta stop them. Stay away from me. Put these on. They have us. Look at them. They're everywhere. We have no other choice. I don't like this one bit. Leave it alone, man. It ain't none of my business, ain't none of yours. We have been lulled into a trance. Listen to what I'm saying to you. We're in trouble. The whole world's in trouble. Control us! You're sending some kind of signals on the TV sets. I've got one that can see. Mama don't like tattletales. <laughs> now we start spilling some blood. Let's go! No, but... <laughs> I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick yes. ass. And I'm all out of bubblegum. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> What a great trailer. Everybody get your Thompson glasses on. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I wish I had them. So it's really, it's such a social commentary back then as it is today. Today. It was even it was ahead of its time, it, really, it, it, honestly. It was, it, was, oh, it was parallel to like idiocracy in a sense, in that sense, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but basically it's about a wanderer who, uh, you know, is coming to a new city um, you know, trying to find work and he finds work on this construction site and, uh, you know, he's living in a homeless camp. 
Yeah, this ad hoc, yes, yeah, homeless camp. And uh, before you know, he, he notices things are, you know, um, are just awry. There's like the, the homeless people, which, uh, you know, they have their own television. <laughs> um, there, every now and then there's this signal that gets broadcast about how, you know, they're taking over and we need to become a, a, awake. And, and uh, so he, he realizes that, uh, um, you know, that the signal seems to be coming from this church right next door. And basically he stumbles upon these, this box of sunglasses that when you put them on, you see the world for what it really is. You put these sunglasses on and everything you look at, whether it's an advertise, a billboard, um, or people, um, or a commercial or yeah, or a commercial. You're right. Right. And everything is, we're all basically the whole message is we're being blinded by the power subliminally being controlled. Right. Right. Um, like behind me, look. Right. Yeah. Or, behind uh, Lucas, just pay, consume. obey, obey, consume. It's capitalism, though. It's the, the message is yeah. capitalism, which is like yeah. the dollar is your God, obey, consume, just be quiet, sleep. Right. Right. You know, and, and, and I give him credit because all of a sudden he's like, all right, we got to eliminate these motherfuckers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's not like he has much of a like well, a, a moment of, of, of clarity. Like, clarity. Yeah, like, it's, like, uh, it's, it's in a little in a sort of uh, metaphorical way. This is like uh, Socrates allegory of the cave where the, the ah. prisoners only ever see the shadows of their captors. Oh. Yeah. Very intellectual. Oh, hey, they're, they're removed from the cave and they see earth as it really and then, is, is. want to mm-hmm. murder the motherfuckers who yeah. set it up it's, but it, it's, yeah. like, it's like that mixed with uh like a conspiracy theory sort of it's uh, like a 50 sci-fi you know invasion of the body snatchers this it's genre, okay it's a genre he's a genre it's filmmaker. not just a genre movie this is the perfect example of a b movie yes perfect on yes. every yes. level it nails a b movie yeah it, to a point where it heightens it past in a movie like this movie remains it was ahead of its time and every year that goes by on this stupid fucking spinning ball in space this movie becomes more and more relevant all the characters were very Mm two-dimensional you know and and it was obvious that the the point of this movie was more of a of a comment on our society and, society. and right you know how we're blinded by, by greed assuming we're in a consumer we're in a consumer economy you know yeah we're being you know, originally we're being surveilled all yeah. the time the privacy is going away you know he you know, wanted all, all um, the kind of things that modern society is stripping away as it provides for us other things yeah. right so that's what i'm saying this movie gets more and more topical yeah. as opposed to less mm-hmm. you, you know, know he originally wanted um to have uh Kurt Russell as the lead in this, and I yes. tell you, this movie is better that it doesn't have Kurt Russell. You think because Roddy I swear Piper, to God, no, like, I swear to God, because yeah. it's what Kevin said. It's because he's like Rowdy Rowdy Roddy Piper is so yeah, for those entertaining the, in it. For those of you who don't know, Rowdy Roddy Piper was a famous famous professional WF wrestler. wrestler before this movie, he, and mostly right. played a heel. He was like yeah. the villain. Yeah, he's a bad he guy. Did it so well. So look, that scene where he goes in, I ch- come here to chew bubble and kick ass. That was him improving. Yeah, like, oh, okay. like, do one of your rowdy yeah. Piper things because like and I think the movie like Nick said it's a B movie and if you had Kurt Russell in there we talked about how Kurt Russell is a goddamn skilled actor like it okay. would have been maybe a, I think Roddy Popper's been, not no but he's fun as fuck right, right? he's movie. great in the role he works and Keith and David it, is an incredible actor and he's yeah. like a, but he's the supporting character that helps like yeah. ground it a little bit but mm-hmm. I don't know it, to me this movie I'm like if Kurt Russell is in it it almost would be like it would feel it awesome. would still be awesome, it would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> they, but they wouldn't have had that fight scene the it's one of, it's considered one of the greatest fight scenes in it cinema like 10 minutes yeah remember, it's ridiculous i remember I, this from a kid yeah, that was yeah, the yeah. only thing that i can remember from this movie was that okay i know there's a, a big fight scene with roddy roddy piper just to get it happened, put on glasses holy shit i couldn't believe how long so it I'm like, yeah in fact it's, it's it's south park in one of their earlier episodes does an episode called cripple fight where they do this fight sequence shot for shot between timmy and oh, jimmy no. 
I did not know that. I know what yeah. you're talking about. Yeah, it, it's pretty I, so if you watch the episode, it's a it's it's a shot for shot remake of the fight scene from They Live. Fantastic. That's that's amazing. That's amazing. You know uh, what? And and speaking of uh, Carpenter doing the score, he did do the score with somebody else with this. And mm-hmm. good God, it was the same thing throughout the entire movie. Oh, it lasts for so it- long. What I remember is literally watching this film and being like, wait, are they still walking with music playing? Like yeah. the whole beginning takes like 20 minutes and they're yeah. like, walk- he's yeah. walking around to a job site. And it's a <laughs> yeah. soundtrack throughout the entire thing. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so are we, we're obviously way over time. We are, we are so much over time. Yeah, we really have to go. But um, John Carpenter, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Go watch his movies. In in the meantime, go, go check out our letterbox at Screen Radar because Lucas is that you got John Carpenter list up on there. Yeah, yep. yeah okay. I keep meaning to go. Up Nick there. and I didn't even but fight mine, over. I know. I know. I know. Right. I know. That's why we need to revisit it. So we can revisit it. Let's do. An, we should do another letterbox list of something. Yes. Nick, you yes. okay. do a rebuttal. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> Make sure to Facebook. follow us at Screen Radar on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and then you can also stream Film Dorks on. Apple Podcasts and Spotify, and then you can find us on all of our other accounts, you know, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, etc. So make sure to go give us a like and a follow and a subscribe. 